What can we do when our sin puts us in impossible situations? In today's episode of Doctrine for Life, Dr. Joel Beakey reveals God's mercy toward Abraham's foolishness in the land of Egypt in the second part of his sermon on Genesis 12, verse 17. If you would like to enjoy more resources from the pen and pulpit of Dr. Beakey, please visit joelbeakey.org. But what could he do? They suddenly came out now and told the truth and said, I'm her husband. Well, the Pharaoh's courtiers would certainly have refused to believe him, would have killed him. But what's going to happen to Sarai? And what's going to happen to God's promises? If Sarai has a child with Pharaoh, what's going to happen to the salvation of God's covenant people? And all because he wouldn't trust the Lord. All because he didn't go to the Lord. What a fool I have been. I tried to make ends meet for myself. And I got myself entangled into an incredible set of difficulties. Abraham's trapped. He's trapped by his own lie. He's trapped in the land of Egypt. And there's nothing he can do. Can't get Sarai back. Can't go back to the promised land without her. Could do nothing. Do you, do you know what it's like to have your sins get you in such a mess like this? To trap you? And then to convict you? It's because I didn't trust God. I didn't keep in touch with Him. I didn't ask Him to guide me. It's my own ingenious, self-protective plan that's destroying me. I'm my own worst enemy. Maybe you didn't go back to Ur or to Haran. You didn't abandon the Christian faith. But you went to Egypt. And you sojourned there. What an expression. He sojourned there for a while. The man of the land of promise sojourned there. You see, he's making compromises. He was backsliding. Now, some of you are backsliding all the time. Some of you are always in Egypt. You've never yet trusted in Christ. You've never walked in the land of promise. You've always tried to run your own life in your own way. And if you're honest, your life is not truly happy. It may not be in a complete mess, but it's certainly become entangled with unhappiness. It's because you're trying to do things without God. If you're five years old, or you're 16 years old, or you're 90 years old, if you try to do things without God, you see, you will destroy yourself. You will cause trouble. You'll make things worse. You'll mess up your life. Even after grace, we we can mess up our lives so easily. Sometimes with one day, one wrong act. Even though we're forgiven, it can take years to get clear of of the mess. You know what Abraham's life should teach us all here? Not to run ahead of the Lord. Not to go forward without Him. To seek guidance at every point. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Well, how in the world did Abram become disentangled from this miserable mess into which he brought himself? And the answer to that is both simple and profound. By God's faithfulness through the suffering Savior. Canaan's famine, Abram's failure, God's faithfulness. How how happy We are, aren't we, that this story doesn't end at the end of verse 16. 
But the three opening words of verse 17 mean so much, don't they? Such a relief. And the Lord. And the Lord. The Lord intervenes. The Lord comes into the picture. Most translations have it. But the Lord over against all of Abram's ways and connivings and sins and failures, the Lord comes. But the Lord. Abram had forgotten the Lord, but the Lord had not forgotten Abram. One-sidedly, graciously, sovereignly. God does not overlook His servant who had overlooked His God. God's plan for Abram was that he and Sarai would have a son. And that son, a line of promise would run through that son, and from him the Messiah would be born, and all nations on the earth would be blessed. You see, it's God's promise, and no foolishness from Abram is going to jeopardize the plan of God. And so God controls Pharaoh. He restrains Pharaoh from taking Sarai as his wife. He takes her into the harem, but he does not yet have a relationship with her. God preserves her purity and chastity for good reason. You've probably been reading all these sordid stories in the paper lately about who is the father of the infant child of the infamous deceased Anna Nicole Smith. But you see, God keeps Pharaoh from this act with Sarai so that there's never a question mark raised about who is the real father of the promised seed. God protects. So there can be no doubt. The promised seed comes through Abraham and Sarai as God had promised. Suppose that Pharaoh would had taken Sarai. Suppose that later she did have a child. Whose son would he be? You see, God acts to in reaction to Abram's act. And God overrules Abram's act and saves him for the worst results of his own folly. But even as we see God wonderfully providing for Abram, We have to understand Abram is in the whole line of historical, redemptive plans and purposes of the living God. It's not just God preserving Abram. It's God preserving his eternal plan of redemption. This story isn't just about God's preservation of one man. It's the preservation of all of his elect. It's the preservation of His covenant. It's about your and my preservation, dear believer. Even today, it's another important history. You see, in God's long historical redemptive stream of promised salvation. So then how does God intervene? Verse 17. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now the word great plagues can also be translated great strokes or beatings, almost like a quick pulsation. Some commentators say these were skin diseases. We don't know for sure. But it was some kind of affliction, intense affliction. Whatever the blows were to Pharaoh and to his house, as one commentator put it, With machine gun rapidity, every blow struck them down to the point that Pharaoh said, something's wrong. Abram's God must be against me. He began to ask questions. Maybe he asked Sarai herself. And maybe she told him. We don't know. I'm, I'm Abram's wife. But anyway, he finds out the truth, you see. God opens his eyes. God intervenes. And Pharaoh then calls Abram before him. He says, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Abram receives a well-deserved rebuke from a heathen man. How humiliating is that? He rebukes him. 
for acting so disgracefully. It's humiliating for a believer to be rebuked by an unbeliever. Abraham's reputation is in tatters. His witness is nil. He creeps out of Egypt, as it were, with his tail between his legs, without uttering one word. He doesn't utter one word now. He leaves Egypt without building any altars to the Lord, without proclaiming the name of the Lord. The whole experience in Egypt is a colossal failure from Abraham's side. And yet from God's side. It's a testimony of his stupendous faithfulness. God marvelously protects Abraham. Pharaoh sends him away with all the gifts that Pharaoh had given him. He doesn't take those gifts back. Moreover, Pharaoh commands his men not to harm Abraham. He's he's afraid the effects of these beatings are still on him. He's afraid that if, if he does anything to Abraham, the God of Abraham will destroy him. And so suddenly, almost before Abraham knows it, God opens the door and does everything. Sarah is back. They can go back to Canaan. God takes care of everything when Abraham can no longer do anything. And in so doing, God preserves not only Abraham, but also his promises and his covenant and his redemption. And this, friends, is the most comforting truth. This is the crowning truth. That's why I picked verse 17 as my particular text this morning. Of the whole passage, this is the culmination. You see, nothing... Nothing, no sin of Abraham, no king of Egypt can stand in the way of God's purposes and God's promises from being fulfilled. God says in Isaiah 14, I have purposed, so shall it stand. And so God's intervention for Abraham is complete. It's gracious. It's faithful. And even more, it's a picture of the gospel in which Jesus Christ does everything for sinners who can do nothing. Would you like to deepen your understanding of Reformed theology? Check out Reform Systematic Theology, Volume 4, Church and Last Things by Dr. Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley. This book will lead you to explore key scripture topics from biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical perspectives. Order the culmination of Dr. Beakey's life's work at heritagebooks.org slash rst4. Some of you are sitting here this morning without the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never repented in truth. You've never believed in truth. You've never been born again. You haven't just failed once or twice. You haven't ever received the gospel. You've been in Egypt all the while. But I declare to you the gospel this morning, my friend. But the Lord, He can come. He's willing to intervene. He can turn your life around. He can save you from your sin. He's almighty. He's willing. He's able. He can make you a new man, a new woman, a new teenager, a new boy, a new girl. He can give you a fresh start, a new heart, a new beginning. And the Lord. But the Lord. Turn to this Lord who can do it. He will preserve you. He will save you. He will watch over you. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying this morning that because the Lord took over for Abraham that we can rush into trouble and then say, please, Lord, get me out of this trouble. 
That's not the way we are to behave. Actually, Abraham, I believe, suffered all his life for this mistake. His marriage was later damaged and his home was divided. Two nations were set against each other. And to this very day, they are still against each other. We read about it in the newspaper every day. The Jews and the Arabs are still at war with each other. Was it in Egypt that Abram and Sarai picked up the Egyptian woman named Hagar, who joined their household and by whom Abram had a son, and by whom he ran ahead of the Lord again later on, and named him Ishmael, who became the father of the Arab peoples? What is happening in the Middle East today? Well, it goes back to, it goes back to Abram's sin with Hagar. So let's not say this morning, if we make mistakes, it doesn't matter. What we can say is, it does matter, and we will suffer the consequences of sin, but by the grace of God, God forgives the sins of his people. They're washed away in Jesus. And he preserves his servants, not because of them, but despite them. That's the encouragement of this text. Think of all the famines we face in our lives. Think of all the testing times, the difficulties. Think of our weaknesses. We're no better than Abraham, are we? Our faith is no stronger by nature. Are we more godly? Do you dare to say Abraham failed, but you wouldn't fail? How do we persevere then? How do we make it to heaven in the end? Because of God's faithfulness. Because God will keep. He kept Abraham. And he'll keep you, dear child of God. Every one of you. Who has been born again and brought to repentance and faith. None of you shall go lost. At my right hand, the psalmist sings. He guards from ill and I shall not be moved. Life's pathway thou wilt show. To thy right hand will guide. Where streams of pleasure ever flow. And boundless joys abide. Every believer shall be preserved. Every believer will be able to say, My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness, e'en for his own name's sake. Oh, this morning, let us humbly bow in the dust and praise God that our frailty cannot wreck God's plan for our lives. And let us understand that that is the gospel, that our weakness cannot prevent us, rather cannot prevent God from making us like his son. Our instability cannot prevent God from bringing us to glory. They shall never perish, said Christ, for no man shall pluck them out of my hand. See, it's God's faithfulness. That's the whole secret of the life of a believer. And do you ask this morning, but how can God be faithful to unfaithful me? My backslidings deserve nothing but hell. I desire to be plagued forever by my sins, like Pharaoh was plagued by God. You're right, my friend. You're totally right. You you do deserve, I do deserve, fully deserve to be plagued by God. But do you notice who God plagues? He doesn't plague Abram. He plagues Pharaoh for Abram's sake. Just let me repeat that so it sinks in. God plagues Pharaoh. For Abram's sake. How could he bypass Abram? Only because he did not bypass his son. God the Father plagued his son, plagued his son with a curse and punishment of your sins, dear believer so that you could be set free 
free the first time, free by renewal, free all your life, to be brought back from every backsliding way, to find all your hope again and again and again in our suffering substitutionary Savior. The last thing I did before I came to church this morning is I looked in the dictionary. I looked up that word plague. It's, I wonder exactly how a dictionary defines the word plague. This is what it said. A calamity sent down from God as divine punishment. That's what God did. That's what the Passion Weeks are all about. God sent down a calamity upon his only begotten son as divine punishment and said, for all my Abrams, for all my elect, for every believer that shall ever live on the face of this earth, oh, my son, you must drink the cup of my wrath to its bottom bitter dregs. You must drink it penally as my punishment for them. You must drink it as a substitute for them. And you see, this is what makes sense of all of Jesus' sufferings. It's what makes sense of him crawling on the ground as a worm and no man in Gethsemane. It's what makes sense of him being mocked as a mock king at Gabbatha. It's what makes sense of Golgotha. It's the only answer to the cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took the plague. He took the machine gun rapidity of the blows of God against the sins that we deserved. And he bore it all. And therefore, Abram can go free. It pleased the Lord, says Isaiah, to bruise his own son. That didn't happen, congregation. You and I wouldn't be here today. We'd all be in hell. Abram too. Even the father of the faithful. It pleased him to bruise his own son. Oh, what a blessing. What love. What incomprehensible love. Have you ever tasted that love? Has it ever caused you to fall on your face with tears? Say, Lord, I can't understand. It's amazing love. Thou was plagued so that I could live in the land of promise and be on my way to glory for Jesus' sake. Do you understand that? A believer doesn't understand it, but he believes it. It's a secret of his life. And the only way we can express it is one word. God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness to me, an unfaithful sinner. Let me close this morning by setting before you three important Practical lessons for our Christian lives. The first is this. Don't minimize your sin. But cast sin off in the strength of Christ. And rededicate yourself to him this morning. Don't minimize your sin. Cast it off. Hebrews 12.1 And rededicate yourself to him this morning, by the grace of God. How do you do that? Well, you think about this. God plagued his son for my sin to preserve me pure. What a price sin has cost him. Oh God, to surrender my whole life to thee is far too small a gift. I can merit nothing, but certainly thou dost deserve my whole life. And so I must return from Egypt. I must return from my backslidings. I must go back to where I departed from the Lord and rededicate my life to Him. And that's what Abram does. 
And you see that in the next chapter, in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 13. When he comes out of Egypt, he went on his journeys, verse 3 says, from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. God brought him back. Back to where he was. Back in the right way with God. And he starts again at the place of faith where he had departed. The place of consecration. The place of worship where God had met him. Where God had blessed him. Oh, can't you see Abraham getting down on his knees there at that place saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. I've wandered. I've been such a fool, Lord. I've caused so much trouble for so many people. I've been such a bad witness in Egypt. I'm ashamed of myself, Lord. But thou... Thou hast been faithful. And here I I, I dedicate myself again as a poor needy sinner to thy grace and to thy faithfulness. And I start over again. That's what we need to do. Do you need to come back to Bethel this morning? Have you wandered from the Lord? small way perhaps, or a bigger way, but you've lost touch with God. You've trusted in your own cleverness. My friend, it's all going to end in tears till you come back to God. God calls you back this morning, back to His grace, back to the altar where you once were. Back to his faithfulness because of the passion Savior who earned the right through his sufferings to bring you back. Start over this morning looking to God. Commit yourself afresh. Thank you for listening to Doctrine for Life with Dr. Joel Beakey. If you were encouraged by this episode and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. To enjoy more resources from the pen and pulpit of Dr. Beakey, please visit joelbeakey.org.